Well, we, uh, as we open up God's Word here this morning, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago after we got out of a long sermon series in the book of John, we, we had a series entitled uh, Return to the Upper Room as we looked at John 13 through 17 through most of the year. The past couple of weeks, I've just been preaching passages that God has brought me under conviction with in my own personal devotional life. This is kind of preaching from the overflow of my own time with the Lord. And today, as we turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21, this passage really gripped me a couple of weeks ago. The title of our message here this morning is Lighthouse Christians. Lighthouse Christians. And you know, I've I've tried really hard over the past couple of years to, to help us to see that the Bible, even though it's 66 individual books, It really is one story, and the more that we see the storyline from Genesis to Revelation, the more we'll begin to see how every piece fits within that story. And one of the main themes of the Bible, when you start with Genesis and you get to Revelation, one of the main themes of the Bible is the theme of light versus darkness. Light versus darkness. And I want to show it to you. I want to share with you maybe five major phases or checkpoints in the story of scripture and how light versus darkness is a theme that continues to come up from Genesis to Revelation. So I want you to remember when you think of the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I want you to think of five words. And here's the five words, creation, fall, promise, redemption, and restoration. I'll give you those five words again. Creation, fall, promise, redemption, and restoration. Those five words will take you to how the earth began and how the earth will be completely restored upon the second coming of Jesus. But I want you to see now how light and darkness fits in the story. All right, so creation, Genesis chapter one, verse three, when God wanted to create the world, he said, let there be That's right. He said, let there be light. There was darkness and no form of the earth. And he said, let there be light. And light is what broke into the darkness during creation. But guess what happened? Sin, which is darkness, entered the world. And it says in Romans, or excuse me, in Genesis chapter three, verse eight, when sin entered the world, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. As we get to fall, the second word, darkness entered the earth, and guess what happened? Man and woman began to hide from the light. Sin is darkness, and when we're living in darkness, what do we do? We do what Adam and Eve did. They hid from the light, but thank goodness, In the midst of that darkness, God shared a promise. That's the third word, promise. And the promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first promise and call of the gospel is that there would be a seed of the woman who would come and crush the head of Satan. In other words, there would be a person of light to come and break into the darkness. All right, and the entire Old Testament is waiting to see this seed from Genesis 3.15. Could this person be the seed? Could Abraham be the seed? Could Moses be the seed? Could David be the seed? But we see all of these men were sinful. But then we see we turn to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see the seed has finally come, and his name is Jesus. And that brings us to the fourth word, redemption. What did Jesus do? He came as the light of the world into a place of darkness. In John chapter one, verses four through five, it says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And that's where we are in the story right now. We're in phase four. We're in the redemption phase. But guess what? The final word, restoration, restoration's coming. And in Revelation chapter 21, at the end of the Bible, this is a future event that has not taken place, the second coming of Jesus Christ and the heaven up there coming down here. It says in Revelation 21, 23, we'll know we're there when we see light coming from God himself. It says, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb who is Jesus. So the whole story of the Bible, I just gave you Genesis to Revelation in five words. Creation, fall, promise, redemption, restoration. God said, let there be light. All right. And then we see with the fall, darkness broke in. 
but we see a promise that light is coming to overcome the darkness. Jesus did come to bring redemption of darkness to light. And eventually all things will be restored and we won't even need the sun or the moon or the stars because we'll be in the presence of God and he himself will be our light. And you say, amen, Bo, that's great. But what do we do right now? Right now in that checkpoint, on those five checkpoints, we're at number four. We're at redemption, but we're not at restoration yet. So what do you and I do until Jesus comes back? Well, you and I are his disciples and we have his spirit living inside of us and we have his word right in front of us. So what are we called to do until Christ comes back? Well, I charge you today, according to Romans chapter 12, you and I are called to be lighthouses. We are called to be pillars who stand firm in the darkness and we pierce the darkness with light and we point to the light of the world whose name is Christ. And that brings us to our big idea here in one sentence. As we read Romans 12, 14 through 21, in one sentence, here's what we're looking at today. Here's our big idea. Lighthouse Christians are kingdom pillars committed to overcoming the darkness of evil by shining the radiant light of God's goodness. I'll read it again. Lighthouse Christians are kingdom pillars committed to overcoming the darkness of evil by shining the radiant light of God's goodness. So, if you want to know how you can be a lighthouse Christian, would you join me by turning to the book of Romans in the New Testament? If you don't have a Bible, you can grab the Pew Bible in front of you or beside you. We're on page 1127 in your Pew Bible. And if you would stand at this time, out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant and fully sufficient word. We are in Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 14 and work our way to the end of the chapter in verse 21. Hear God's word to us through his servant, the apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing to the church in Rome. Verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And here's a summary statement for everything I just read. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We seek you at this moment. Lord, as many things in your word often are, what we just read is simple, but it's not easy. You call us to overcome evil with good and overcome darkness with light. And Lord, because we ourselves are broken people, this is something that we struggle with every day. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit as we walk through this passage that what I'm preaching today by the guidance of your spirit, that it would be practical Christian living, that we would leave the walls of this church and do this today, that we would listen to verse 14 and do verse 14 today. We would listen to verse 15 and do verse 15 today. I pray that today is not poetry, that today is not metaphorical, that today is literal, practical Christian living, and that we would seek to obey you today as an act of worship. Help us. Help us to to do this. Help us to stop saying this. Help us to do it. We can't do it in our strength but we can do it in yours. So help us now, I pray. In Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Romans uh, is one of the most polarizing books of the Bible. For the first 11 chapters of Romans, you will find some of the deepest and most challenging theology that you'll find in all of Scripture. But when you get to Romans 12, Paul takes the first 11 chapters that are filled with all these deep, mysterious truths, 
And we get to chapter 12 and he makes it as practical as he possibly can. He's saying, listen, there's a great depth and mystery to the plan of God and all the things that he's done, but let's make how we respond to this as practical as possible. So Romans 12 is practical Christian living. Again, it's simple, but it's not easy. And, and as we read these words today, we're held accountable all right, th- th- what is written here in these verses is clear enough for a child to understand, but we need the grace of God every day to be faithful to these words. We need to be what I am calling today lighthouse Christians who respond to the darkness by piercing it with the light of Christ. And how do we do that? I'm grateful that that Paul took the time inspired of the Holy Spirit to give us practical steps to do that. And so we're going to look at four aspects of a lighthouse Christian in the time that we have left. And we're going to get as practical as we can. So here's number one. Lighthouse Christians overcome persecution with blessing. Overcome persecution with blessing. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. All right. Basically, it comes down to this. When you are being persecuted, you can, be, you can respond of one of two ways. You can be a mirror or you can be a lighthouse. A mirror reflects darkness back to darkness. You persecute me, I persecute you. You yell at me, I'm going to yell louder. You attack my values, I'm going to scream even louder about my values and attack you. And basically, that's a good summary statement of where we are as a country right now. Now, we can be a mirror or we can be a lighthouse. All right, now, a lighthouse does not stay with the light turned off and just ignore the darkness. But a lighthouse pierces and penetrates the darkness and gives those in darkness something they can see, something that attracts them, something that helps them to come off the stormy waters of the the sea and brings them safely to a kingdom shore. We need to be a lighthouse. Now, when you and I are persecuted, our natural human response is not, how do I bless this person? Okay? We often call it a come to Jesus moment, but we're not really talking about sharing the gospel when we say come to Jesus. Right? So under persecution, our natural instinct, because we're fallen human beings, is not to bless. It is to one-up them in persecution. It is to seek revenge. But how do we do this? Well, I think one of the ways that we can do this is to remember that you and I are blessed eternally when we respond in obedience to persecution. And how do I know that? Well, there's a lot that, that Jesus himself says in Matthew 5 about what Paul says in Romans 12. Matthew 5, verses 11 through 12, Jesus reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So how do we do this? How do we, in, in, you know, controlled by the Holy Spirit, how do we respond to those who persecute us by blessing them? Well, we remind ourselves that we are storing up eternal blessings and rewards because of this persecution. And then how do we bless them in practical ways? Well, we can pray for them, we can encourage them, and we can secretly bless them. So when somebody persecutes you, when somebody responds to you in anger or sarcasm or embarrasses you, the first thing you can do is pray for them. And not just pray that God will tear them down, pray that God will bless them. The more that you pray for God to bless those who anger you the most, the quicker your anger towards them is going to change. All right, and then not only do we pray for them, we can encourage them. I'm not saying we affirm them when they are saying something contrary to the word of God. What I am saying is we can find common ground to encourage them in other areas. And then all of a sudden they see something is different in us. And then here's another thing, we can secretly bless them. We can do something that no one, maybe not even them themselves will know. We can bless them. We can bless them with a gift or we can bless them by by doing something that nobody knows but God. And when we do that, we're a lighthouse piercing the darkness. We're not responding as a mirror showing darkness back to darkness. No, we're piercing it with light. And I guarantee it will catch them off guard. 
they will say something is different about them. They did not respond to my anger by yelling even louder with capital letters on social media. They're loving me and encouraging me. I want to know what they know. And we can say, well, I want you to know who I know. His name is Jesus. So first, Lighthouse Christians overcome persecution with blessing. Number two, Lighthouse Christians overcome evil with honor. Verses 15 through 17, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, never be wise in your own sight, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. So what is honorable? Well, in the kingdom of God, it's been said by Christians for decades, the way up is down. So honorable means humility. You want to be a lighthouse Christian, you take a posture of humility when someone is persecuting you in pride. You don't respond by, respond by bowing out your chest and saying, I'm going to respond to pride with pride. No, he says, take a lowly position, associate with the lowly, do what is honorable. All right, we need to take a posture of humility. And again, humility does not mean we are silent about what we believe. Humility means I'm not going to shove what I do believe down your throat. I'm not going to march down the street with pride over what I believe. I'm going to live it out in front of you, and I'm going to share it with a humble tone, and I'm going to give God room to change your heart. You know, I, I want to give you two practical ways that you can be honorable in the presence of evil. First is, remember your own sin in light of Christ's righteousness. When you're in the presence of somebody who is evil, remind yourself that according to the holy standards of God, you and I are evil too. You, you ever spend time with a person you're getting to know and you ask yourself the question, is this a good person? Can I trust this person? And maybe over the course of time, somebody mentions that person and says, hey, listen, you can't trust them. They're not a good person. Or, man, they're a really good person. You know, if you start measuring by the standards of other people, you're always going to question, is this a good person? Is this not a good person? Can I say this? You and I are broken. You and I are not good in comparison to the holiness of God. And when we realize, apart from the grace of God, we're in serious trouble, the more we stop looking at other people saying, you are evil, you are not good. All right? We need to start looking at people he, either who have Jesus or need Jesus. And we can be humble in the presence of people who persecute us when we remind ourselves we're in trouble without the grace of God ourselves. The second is we need to see everyone as valuable image bearers, worthy of dignity and respect. Every human being, no matter how you know, volatile they are, no matter how divisive they are, no matter how bitter they are, no matter what they've done to you, they are made in the image of God. Jesus Christ took the cross for them to know God. They are worthy of our respect. I don't care who they are. I don't care who they vote for. I don't care what they say on social media. You owe them respect. So start respecting them. Stop yelling at them. God died for them. And it is not his will that any should perish, but all should come to a knowledge of the truth. Think of the cross. Think of the cross when somebody spits on your Christian values. Why do they do it? It's because they don't know better. It's because they're walking around in darkness. I mentioned this quote before. Many, many years ago, it was said uh, by Chuck Colson, you can't be angry at a blind man for stepping on your shoes. How do you respond? You shed light. You shed light. So number two, lighthouse Christians overcome evil with honor. Number three, lighthouse Christians overcome conflict with peace. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, conflict is part of living in a broken world. You and I have no excuse to be surprised by conflict. All right, uh, I lived many years in Florida in my early 20s, and I realized it was not a matter of if but when hurricanes were coming. If you live in Florida and you get ravaged by a hurricane and the first thought is, I never saw this coming, then you've been living in blindness. All right, every resident of Florida has a decision to make. I either prepare for the hurricane or I don't. It's not, I'm going to live and hope that hurricanes don't come. They're coming. 
All right, if you and I are Christians, we should not be surprised by conflict. We should not be surprised by conflict in our neighborhoods. We should not be surprised by conflict in our work. We should not be surprised by conflict in our school. We should not be surprised by conflict in this church. We are broken people. So the question is not, can we just pretend that conflict is not gonna happen? No, the question is, are we prepared when it does? And how do you and I prepare for conflict? We go into every situation looking to bring peace. Now, I will say this, in every church, including this one, it's usually the small percentage, but there's a small percentage of people who are wired by God to be peacemakers. And you know who I'm talking about. There's certain people in this room right now that, that when they walk into a room, it's like peace just entered this room. There was chaos, but now there seems to be order in this room. Can I just say, I want more of those people in my life. Why don't you be one of those people? All right, blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When we walk into a room and our first thought is, where can I find common ground with this person? Instead of, where can I assert my beliefs? Where can I shove it down their throats? Where can I say it like it needs to be said? No. Where can I enter into this room and connect with this person? Maybe this person and I are not going to share beliefs when it comes to Christ, but I'm going to find common ground, and on that common ground, I'm going to build a relationship where they can come to know my faith. You know, Brother Larry said it perfectly about our time in Bangladesh. They were incredibly gracious people, but they're lost. But we didn't storm into Bangladesh, pounding pulpits, screaming from the top of our lungs, turn or burn. No, we establish relationships. We establish relationships and found common ground on certain things because they are image bearers worthy of dignity and respect. And once those relationships are built, we do what God's called us to do. We share the gospel. It was our host family did an amazing thing. We were with a, a non-believer in Rampora who owned a small business. And we were sitting there and it was awesome to watch them work. All right, the husband t uh, sat down for t 20 minutes sharing the story of the Bible, and he started with the things that Muslims and Christians can agree on. And then finally got to the cross and said, here's how Jesus is not a prophet, but he's the Savior. And then he handed him a Gospel of John written in Bengali and said, please read this. I'd like to come back and talk with you about it. That's how you become a lighthouse Christian. Amen. That's how it's done. That's what we're called to do. We, we've got to stop responding to anger with anger, and we've got to stop being surprised at conflict. It's part of the brokenness that we live in, and it's always going to be. But again, remember Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. All right, so we've talked about three ways that we can be lighthouse Christians. We overcome persecution with blessing. We overcome evil with honor. We overcome conflict with peace. Fourth and finally... Lighthouse Christians overcome injustice with service. We overcome injustice with service. Verses 19 through 21. This is huge. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now let's, let's end by saying this. God is just, which means every ounce of injustice is something that has not uh, gotten past him. Trying to sneak injustice past God is like trying to sneak the sun past a rooster. It's not going to happen. He sees all, he knows all, and God will bring final justice to every moment of evil here on planet earth. And so we need to take a deep breath. You and I are off the hook. We don't have to avenge ourselves. We do not have to stick out our chest. We do not have to get loud and proud. We are where we are as a country, not because we were quiet, because we stopped being lighthouse Christians. We are worried about injustice. Don't be. You be a lighthouse. How do you do that? Give room for God to bring vengeance. You live out your Christian faith with grace and consistency. Let them see your testimony. You know, one of the best things you can do, especially now during election time, I challenge you. 
Find someone who completely disagrees with what you believe and invite them to your house for dinner. Invite them to your house for dinner and begin a friendship with them. And let them see what Christianity looks like at your kitchen table. And continue loving them. It's the only way that light's going to break into the darkness. What happens when you get on social media with capital letters and yell at them? It's not going to change anything. That's why we are where we are. We stopped being lighthouses and we started being mirrors. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. I'd say log off of social media, open your front door, and let them inside. Love them where they are. And understand that only God can change their hearts the way he changed my heart and changed your heart. You know, I, I think about this all the time. I got saved at 27, and only now, living in light, do I realize just how liberal and dark my upbringing was. But I can go back and see that God has been, he's had his hand on me my whole life. But you know what? Over the years when I had very aggressive Christians share with me with just, a, just an anger or a sarcasm or a turn or burn type mentality, it didn't draw me to God. It pushed me further away. But I, you know, I think back in my life of the people that witnessed to me and they didn't water down what they believed, but they shared it with such grace and then they backed off and gave me room to process and think and they invited me into their homes and they treated me with respect. That's what brought the barriers down for me to come to know Christ. And I believe that's how God works because I believe that's what he's saying in verses 14 through 21. Now, I, you're going to laugh when I say this, but I'm not really being funny. It says in, uh, in verse 20, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. A couple of years ago, actually many years ago, I had a friend in this community who somebody did him wrong, and so he went to bless that person. And as he did something to bless that person, he stared at them like this, and it was really strange. And I went home and I said, why were you staring at that person? And he said, I was just watching coal upon coal being put on their head. Can I just say something? That's not the tone of this passage. We don't celebrate, all right, others in their own persecution. Yes, God is just. And yes, we want to see injustice brought to light. But why don't we let God do what God does? Now, there's something about human beings. We want to see injustice finally brought to resolution. That's why in movies, if you see the bad guy finally get what he's got coming and you watch it in the theater, people roar with applause. I mean, I think back to movies, and I don't want to mention some of them because they're not Christian movies at all, but in my BC days, before I got saved, I remember watching mafia movies, and I remember there were certain parts of every mafia movie where some guy who had it coming finally got it. And there's something inside of us that cheers. But can I just tell you this? Hell is forever. Nobody in this room ought to ever celebrate anybody being in hell except Satan. You and I have permission from God to celebrate Satan being tormented for all of eternity because he's going to go where he deserves to go and he's going to get what he's got coming. But he's not made in the image of God. Everybody else who is... We should not celebrate the pain that they're going to go through if they don't know Jesus. So let's have a burden for them. Let's be a lighthouse Christian and shine in that darkness. Let's overcome injustice with service. When people persecute you, serve them. Bless them. Offer things to them. That's, that's how we're going to pierce through the darkness. We need to leave room for God to do what only God can do. And when you do that, it's an act of worship, and here's why. That, that desire, that urge that you have to get back at them, when you just say, as much as I want to see them get what they got coming, I'm going to bite my tongue, and I'm going to give you room, God, to do what you can do. When you do that, you're saying, God, I trust you. It hurts, God, but I trust you. You will make it right. And so as an act of worship, I'm going to withhold what I really want to say because I trust that you're going to bring this to light. It takes faith to do that. It's hard, but it can happen. If we were not capable of doing that, God would not tell us he commands us to do that. In his grace, it can be done. Without his grace, it can't, but with his grace, it can. So how do I sum this up in one sentence? 
Lighthouse Christians demonstrate the only way to overcome the evil of sin by bringing the good news of the gospel. Lighthouse Christians demonstrate the only way to overcome the evil of sin by bringing the good news of the gospel. How do we overcome darkness? We have got to have light. Where does the light come from? It comes from Jesus himself. He is the light of the world. He's the only answer to the problem of sin. He's the only answer to the problem of the United States of America. He's the only answer to the struggles that you're going through in your own life right now. The good news of the gospel is how good overcomes evil. They need to know. Everybody needs to know. We need to remind ourselves daily when we're living in darkness. You and I are made in the image of God, but we fall short of His glory, and we are in need of His grace, which has been made possible by His Son. And when we repent and believe, we've been forgiven, we've been adopted, we've been redeemed, and we are going to be restored Everything that's broken will be made whole. Everything in darkness will be brought to light because of Jesus. So we take that good news to other people. That is how you and I become a lighthouse Christian. If we don't have Jesus, we've got nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He's all we need. So you and I remember, we bring Jesus with us everywhere we go. And so as we draw to a close, I just want to say, If you're in this room right now and you have been overcome by darkness, remember verse 21. I'll read it again. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Maybe maybe you're not a Christian and you just look at the brokenness around you and you wonder, where's hope? The answer is Christ. Because where there's Jesus, there is always hope. Jesus takes broken things, and as as Jody was singing, he makes beauty from ashes. But maybe you are a Christian, and you have drifted into the darkness. It happens. It happens with all of us. Can I be honest? It especially happens during election time. This is the time of the year where we pull out the heavy artillery. Can I say this is the time we need to be a lighthouse? And if you're the one that's been drifting out, let the light bring you back to the shore. And if you're on solid ground, you turn that light on and you shine it. This is a time to be a faithful witness for Christ. Let's be lighthouse Christians. And let's turn the kingdom of God upside down. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I want so desperately for this to be practical Christian living for us. I don't want this to be a metaphor, a cute illustration that just dies before we finish our lunch. Lord, darkness is all around us, but we have the light of the world inside of us through Christ. Help us to to see how we can be a lighthouse. Lord, I pray that as the word has gone out here this morning, that your Holy Spirit would bring application to each and every one of our lives. How can we practically in the week ahead shine light in dark places? Help us, Lord. Help us to be lighthouse Christians. Where there's Christ, there's light. Help us to shine that light, I pray. In Christ's name. Amen.